strong and true, where all God's children dare to seek to dream God's reign anew. Here the cross shall stand as witness, as a symbol of God's grace. Here as one we claim the faith of Jesus. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where love is found in water, wine, and wheat. A banquet all on holy ground where peace and justice meet. Hear the love of God through Jesus is revealed in time and space as we share in Christ the feast that frees us, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where hands will reach beyond the wood and stone to heal and strengthen, serve and teach, and live the word they've known. Hear the outcast and the stranger bear the image of God's face. Let us bring an end to fear and danger. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where all are named, their songs and visions heard, and loved and treasured, taught and claimed as words within the word. Built of tears and cries and laughter, prayers of faith and songs of grace. Let this house proclaim from floor to rafter, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us pray. O oh God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
First reading is from Jeremiah 11. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their evil deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know it was against me. That they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruits. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. But you, O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retribution upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Word of God. For Psalm 54, we will say it responsively. Save me, O God, by your name and your might, defend my cause. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me, and the ruthless have sought my life, those who have no regard for God. It's the Lord who sustains my life. Render evil to those who spy on me, and your faithfulness destroy them. We will sacrifice. Thank you. O Lord, for it is good. For you have rescued me from every trouble, and my eye looks down on my enemies. And now a second reading from James 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war with you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Word of God. words 
The Holy Gospel according to Mark chapter 9. Jesus and the disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, where he was in the house, he asked them, What are you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another, Who is the greatest? He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of our Lord. As I perceive it, the message here today is the good news that Jesus taught and preached and lived is loose in the world, in your world. Its influence is popping up all over. Jesus demonstrated how the good news was alive nearly 2,000 years ago, and it is just alive now. The question is, do you believe that? Do you believe God is truly at work in all kinds of ways in this world. Jesus' first disciples were doubtful about this fact. In fact, our gospel writer often points out that the disciples were feared or were filled more with fear than faith. Today we hear how they were, number one, afraid even to ask Jesus what he meant when he talked about the Son of Man being betrayed, killed, and rising again. Number two, they were afraid to answer him when he asked them and confronted about them, confronted them with what they were arguing about. To counter all this doubt and fear, Jesus simply takes a child in his arms and says that those who welcome someone considered the least in status like this child welcomes him and the God who sent him. You see, the disciples had a problem. Their egos were weak. That is, their sense of being a loved child of God had not sunk deep into their souls. So they each fed their weak egos by arguing that they were the most important in Jesus' group. They had this need to feel accepted and important like we all do. And it took them a long time being with Jesus to soak into their souls God's amazing grace about that. The disciples aren't alone in this. Faithless egos, that is, self-doubt about the good God has put in us, is cause of a lot of harm. Take this story from the Second World War. Um, England and Germany both had state-of-the-art fighter planes. Germany had the Messerschmitt, which was considered to be the world's fastest fighter plane. The British had the Supermarine Spitfire. The Spitfire was slower than the Messerschmitt. Nevertheless, German pilots were envious of their British counterparts. You see, the Messerschmitt had been designed to seat the perfect German. And who was the perfect German at that time? Who else but the Führer? Adolf Hitler. Hitler was little more than five feet tall. However, the German pilots who guided the Messerschmitts were considerably taller than the five feet. So the Germans had to fly in very cramped quarters. But who was going to tell Adolf Hitler that he was not the perfect German? 
The Messerschmitts were faster, but their pilots were not happy men. Now, relating to this, the fact is many leaders fail because of their big egos. Big men in little planes. Big egos in little men. A twisted ego, a twisted sense of self can cause a lot of undoing to the person and the people around them. Perhaps you have observed a couple people trying to one-up one another. They boast about their accomplishments. They claim they can do some amazing thing. Each person claims that they are some way better than the other person. One of them may go away from the conversation thinking they truly are the greatest. As observers, we would have to ask, what spiritual need drives these people to do this? Jesus must have been sensitive to that spiritual need. One day, while Jesus was hiking from one town to another with his disciples, he overhears them arguing about who is the greatest. So when they got to the place where they were going, Jesus had them sit down and ask them, what were you arguing about on the way? They didn't answer. They are probably a bit embarrassed that they were exercising their egos and arguing who was greatest among them. They didn't have to answer. Jesus knew what was going on, and it was a perfect teaching situation. So, said Jesus, you want to know who's greatest among people? I'll show you. He puts a little child in the middle of the group and says, whoever welcomes such a child in my name welcomes me and also welcomes the one who sent me, God. Jesus was implying that the one who welcomes a little child is the greatest. In the culture of Jesus' time, children were seen as weak and needy, and thus not as important as adults. Yet Jesus says those who included and cared about the weak and needy are the ones who are greatest. The disciples with the big egos were silenced. Well, it was not that those disciples really had big egos, but they had weak egos and a big need to feed their egos to make themselves feel important. Jesus talked to them to help them deal with this spiritual crisis and attitude going on inside of them, to help them deal with their spiritual need. He wanted the disciples to think about what really makes people great. Jesus said and demonstrated the answer, of course, throughout his ministry. What makes the greatness of, human, of humans comes out of their willingness to love and care for others, to serve. Now, I suspect Jesus saw this learning, even this moment, as the development of a slow process in developing the spirits of those original disciples. For one thing, their need for self-importance and their own security made them blind to God's very presence all around them. God was not just up in heaven. God was in the acts of love and kindness that were happening around them. In my own daily life, I sometimes forget this. I was thankful to be part of a Bible study this week that reminded me that all kinds of so-called random acts of kindness are going on around us. One man told how he just recently was driving north on Alpine Road when the car in front of him stalled. He had to back up a bit to go around him, but before he could do that, three other people had stopped their vehicles and started pushing this stalled vehicle up the, up the hill a little bit and off to a side road. Then all of a sudden, there were two other people who got out of their car and were helping them do this, uh, this task. The thought came to the observer, ah, there is goodness in people, a lot of people, and sometimes I forget it's there. Whether they knew it or not, you see, the car pushers were letting God's love shine through them. This reminded me of a, a phone call I received from my wife a few years ago. She had driven from Roscoe, where we were living, to Pontiac, Illinois, to visit her parents, and I stayed at home. She called to tell me she had started back home in a snowstorm, 
And the road was so slick that when she turned a corner out in the country area, she slid into a ditch. My first thought, I'm a hundred miles away. What do you want me to do? My second thought, do I drive there? Do I call 911? Do I call a tow truck? A truck? But if, as Connie and I talked, a truck with four young men stopped near her car. In a few minutes, they had her out of the ditch and back on the road. Connie tried to pay them, but they refused to take any money. Hey, God's love and kindness is all over the place. Certainly, all of you know stories where someone was reached out in some little or large way to help you or others. Certainly, you know the loving acts this congregation does in reaching out to the community around it. Actually, I'd like you to just take a minute to tell someone, talk to someone next to you right now, that where you've recently seen some act of kindness or God sharing in some way. Just do that for 30 seconds. Just, it's okay to talk. I'm sure if you had more time, you could think of other stories. Because sometimes we just, these things go on around us and we're not conscious of them. But these stories that we think about and, and the observations um, are, are saying to us, keep our eyes open and our minds open to where God is acting through the spirits of people even when they don't realize it. This is the perspective those first 12 disciples needed to learn in order to overcome their doubt that God is alive among them and that God is alive where they are serving others. When we confess our faith in the words of the creed, when we offer ourselves to God in prayer, we join Christians all over the world in declaring Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And like those first disciples, we see this as not a one-time thing, but a process. By the power of God's Holy Spirit, we continue to grow each day in the spiritual image of Christ. That doesn't mean we'll be perfect, but it does mean that we can continue to grow in love, compassion, and abilities to forgive and accept others. To grow in recognizing where God is at work all around us, within us, and out in the events of the world. To be part of that faith process is as much a part of Christian life as our salvation. We may think pretty highly of ourselves as Christians, but if we're not more loving, more accepting, more compassionate than when we first began our Christian journey, we might be stuck in our own egos. Interestingly, the crowning achievement in life, what makes us great, is humbling ourselves to serve those who are less fortunate, those who do not have the advantages that we have, those who do not know God's amazing grace, and those who are right next to us who are in need. Ah, big men in little planes. Why were they in those planes? Because of one big ego in a little man. God wants us to stand up by humbling ourselves as Christ humbled himself. We're invited to dedicate our lives as he dedicated his life to help and serve the world. If we want to be number one, if we want to be great, in this society, well, if we just want to be what God wants us to be, Jesus gives us the blueprint. Make this a better world for all God's children. In the words of truly one of the greatest people of the last century, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, he says, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, the only ones among you who will really be happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. That kind of service, that hospitality, is alive in the world. It's alive in you. God's work in our hands. Look around and see that. Look inside you and notice the work of God in you. And live in the peace of God's amazing grace. 
Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you again for reminding us who we are, that we are your beloved people, that when we've messed up, you forgive us, that when we've been too timid in sharing your care, you give us courage. Help us turn loose the peace that, and the love that we've known and carry in our hearts. Help us share with strength an attitude of service to others. Strengthen our faith as we take notice of your kindness and your service alive in the people around us. Let it be so this week. In Jesus' name, amen. And now for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. earth. I, I believe, believe in, in Jesus Christ, Christ God's, God's only Son, Son, our Lord, who was conceived, conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was crucified, died, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. dead. On the, On the third, third day, day he, he rose again. again. He, he ascended, ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, healer, redeemer, and sustainer in a world full of weariness, uncertainty, and full of beauty and community, we call to you. Hear our prayers for us and for all those in need, O oh God. Communal God, be with and guide our church leaders. We pray for the presiding Bishop Eaton, Bishop Clements, Pastor Hines, and Pastor Thomas. Guide us as your church, O oh God, in our shared ministry in Christ's name, to love our neighbor and your creation as Christ has taught us. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for guidance and healing to your wounded creation. Bring comfort and guidance to all those affected by natural disasters, 
such as earthquakes, hurricanes, wildfires, and droughts. We pray especially for Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, California, the Northeast and the Northwest, Haiti, and Mexico. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. Sustainer God, in the thick of pandemic and in the ongoing cries of dismantling ra systemic racism, lay your healing and sustaining hands on those on both front lines. Be with all essential workers, including those in healthcare, in education, and in retail and food service. We also pray for those on the front lines organizing and rallying for justice so there could be true peace. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. Present God, we give thanks for all the blessings and good news during this time of changing seasons. Thank you, O oh God, for the gift of discovery and new ways to gather uniquely and safely. Thank you for the gift of outreach, of hope-filled reunions and new beginnings. And we give thanks for the newly ordained, especially for Pastor Alfie Wyatt. Be with Alfie and remind them of your everlasting presence and be with them as they enter their new call to serve your church at St. Andrew's Lutheran. We give thanks, O oh God, for the good news of your internal unconditional love for all of us through your Son, Jesus Christ. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. Healer God, grant peace and love to those who are suffering in mind, body, and spirit. Be especially with Pastor Amy and any others we name aloud or in our hearts. Bring comfort to all who grieve, all who are lonely, all who are overcoming addictions, and all who are weary. And be with those who are grieving for the deceased, especially for the family of Don Carlson Jr. and any others we name aloud or in our hearts. The Granger family. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. And to your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us share this time of peace with one another. God's peace. As we prepare for um, Holy Communion, we invite those at home to join us for communion with a bread or a, way, a cracker or wine and juice. And here we'll prepare with, with, by taking the wafer from our cup. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. O oh God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts, so that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life, amen. Let us pray together the words our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.